So welcome to the new week. Uh, I wanted to give you a quick, quick overview of what we are planning to cover this week and the relevance of what we will cover this week and project number one, obviously. So the, uh, uh, in the beginning, we are going to revisit a little bit Lasso and Ridge and look at their interpretations. And in particular, we're going to look at the statistical interpretation, which uh, perhaps aids or helps a little bit in uh, understanding what these methods actually imply and how you can interpret them. So there's going to be a little bit of statistics. Then when we've done with that, we are going to continue with statistics. And the big topic uh, is resampling methods. And among the resampling methods, we are going to look at two widely used ones. So one is called bootstrap, so lots of funny names here. And uh, the other one is cross-validation. But you have popular methods like uh, jackknife, another funny name. Uh, you have uh, blocking and so on. But those which are very much used in uh, machine learning are methods like bootstrap and uh, cross-validation. Now, cross-validation is the one which is, tends to be more used, but bootstrap is very simple to implement. And it's also simple to use when you want to study this kind of uh, holy grail in machine learning, which is the so-called bias-variance trade-off. And this is another topic which we are going to uh, scratch the surface of today. And then tomorrow we are going to uh, derive the bias variance uh, trade-off or the bias variance relation so that you can actually see how you can use that in project number one. And also concerning project number one, uh, I will intersperse a little bit here and there, uh, small things which pertain to project one, but also if you spot things which are unclear, don't hesitate to bring them up at the lab or uh, during the lectures here. Moreover, with the elements we have today and tomorrow, you should basically have everything which is needed for project number one, hopefully. So let me quickly, quickly remind you uh, a little bit of the bootstrap, now of the uh, basic relations which we have been looking at. So one of the things which we did two weeks ago was to derive the ordinary least square equations using a statistical interpretation. So let me quickly remind you of that. And you've seen that in project number one in the first exercise where you ask to calculate the expectation value of the y. And you found that y is given by this matrix x times the parameter beta. And you found also that the variance of y is given by sigma squared which is the same variance as you have for the added normally distributed noise. Okay. Now, if you uh, uh, then want to make a model and keep in mind that everything we do now is just an assumption about real data. The data you're looking at may not follow a normal distribution or Gaussian. They may not be identically distributed and independent variables. But we are making the assumption, OK? So making that assumption, we can then uh, set up a uh, probability distribution for the outputs y of i. We have assumed that the x of i's are stochastic variables. And sometimes you may see this written in slightly different ways. But what we are saying now is that we have this normal distribution. And what you could do then, if you look at here, I, I put together y and x, because this is the domain of events. So what I'm saying in that expression, since you have this vertical sign, is that given b, what is the likelihood of finding y with that specific x? Alternatively, you could say, what is the likelihood of y given x and beta? But it's normal to just set up the domain of events. So remember now that the domain of events includes your input, which are the x's, and your outputs. And you are going to make a model which fits the best possible way these data which you have. So what we are assuming here now, based on the expectation values which we've calculated for the y's, is that the uh, y's are distributed according to a normal distribution. <clears throat> 
And since we also make the assumption that they are independent, that means that the probability distribution of many such events is simply the product of the single events. Doing that, we can then construct a likelihood or probability distribution, which is given as a product of all the individual ones. And since we define this uh, domain, and if we are just simplifying things to one dimension for X, in general, X actually contains many features and we would represent it as a matrix. But then we have a, a domain D and then we will simply write it like this and we call this the probability of finding the output or the, uh, the domain D with a given beta. So this is the way we would read this conditional probability. So this is normally called a conditional probability. And then what we did next was simply to assume that we want to maximize the likelihood. So we are not that interested in minimizing the likelihood in general, right? So we want to find a model which maximizes the likelihood of finding the outputs wise. I hope that sounds logical, right? We are, not, we are often not interested in the minimal likelihood, but more in the maximal likelihood. And then we are going to ask ourselves, what are the parameters beta which maximize this likelihood? So these parameters beta are also called estimators. And you will see this as the maximum likelihood estimators as a kind of shorthand in the literature, MLE. So what we do then is that we calculate the derivative of this function and we, with respect to beta, and we want to maximize the likelihood. However, to maximize a product is a little bit tricky. And if you take the log, that's the same, uh, ends up being the same type of problem. So you can take the log of that function, and that means simply that you have a sum over the different points, or the different contributions, and then you would define a new cost function. And since we like to minimize instead of maximizing, we take minus log, and this is a function which uh, uh, is an ever uh, decreasing function. And the, uh, we take then the log of the function, and that means that we end up with the, if you take the constants here, you take them away because they don't depend on beta, and take the derivative, we end up with the same equation which we had for ordinary least squares based on a linear algebra, from a linear algebra point of view. So this is the, the way you can derive the standard ordinary least squares equations. Now, what we can do now is actually to go back to Bayes theorem, which plays the same role as uh, Pythagoras in geometry, and actually make a model for the distributions of the betas. Now, depending on the type of distribution, we will get lasso or ridge regression or other types of linear regression models. So remember that they're called linear regression because your model is linear in the parameters beta, but your model itself may be a polynomial of degree 10, but it's linear in the par unknown parameters beta. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is just to remind you a little bit of, about uh, Bayes' theorem, and then we're going back to the, uh, uh, to the, uh, to the Jupyter notebook and we're going to make some runs and try to convince ourselves that what we see sounds logical. So let's drop, go into the whiteboard. Any questions so far? So this was just a reminder of what we saw from two weeks ago. So let me quickly remind you of Bayes' theorem, because I know that many of you uh, may be a little bit rusty when it comes to uh, statistics, or you may not have had a course in statistics. So there are some elements, and many of these elements are actually pretty simple. So what we assumed is that we have a domain of events, and this contains uh, our inputs, and outputs, and these go up to xn minus one, to y of n minus one. And when we looked at the, 
ordinary least squares, OLS, what we assume then is that the events I, they are just, and I'm, I'm going to drop the beta now. No, sorry, not the beta, the x's. So I'm just writing the y's. I hope you, uh, so implicitly there's also an x, but we're just going to leave it out here. So this is something you can read. What is the probability of finding y with a given beta? And what we did then was to make an assumption that these are IIDs, independent and identically distributed stochastic variables. And we assume that we can reproduce this by a Gaussian distribution. And this contains simply the exponential. And then I have minus y of i. And then we have this uh, notation here, which you probably are now gotten used to, divided by 2 sigma squared. Like that. And then we made the uh, probability distribution for the whole domain of events. So what is the likelihood of finding uh, this output D uh, with a given beta? And that's something which we simply set up since we assume that they are identically distributed. We simply set it up as a product of all the possible events. So this would be a P of YI with a given beta. And then we calculate the, uh, we take the log and then we minimize the problem, the negative log. And then we found the same expressions which we did before. So let's now remind ourselves about Bayes theorem. So if we now look at Bayes theorem, it's based on uh, three uh, postulates in statistics. So we have something which is called the product rule. And you will often see that written as a probability of A and B. And sometimes you will see that written in terms of the union sign A. So this is A is read as the probability of A and B, which can then be written as the probability of A given B multiplied with P of B. And this is the same as P of B given A multiplied with the probability of A. So this is one of these uh, fundamental uh, rules in statistics. So you may have seen it or you may not. If you have not, I mean, many of these kind of rules are very logical and intuitive. So my kind of take on statistics is statistics is actually something which can be taught in a very intuitive way. So many of the axioms are actually logical. You may not believe me here. Yeah. Then we have something which we call the uh, marginal probability distribution or the marginal probability. So I, I'm going to use interchangeably distribution, probability, and likelihood, but I will try to be a little bit consistent when we come to Bayes' theorem. So this is uh, uh, simply a uh, sum over all the other events. So what we are doing now is that we are taking the sum in a way we are integrating away if we have a continuous distribution or summing away the degrees of freedom represented by B. And you can define the same for A, P of A and P of B. It's the same type of expression except that when you have P of B, we are summing over all the events A. So this sum little b, lower key b, is something which uh, now runs over all the possible events in the domain for uppercase letter b. And this uh, is simply given by, if I use the product rule now, it would be a sum over p of a, and we can actually rewrite it. So this should actually not be like that. It should have a comma here, because then we would rewrite it like this, P of B times P and uppercase B and lowercase B. So this is a uh, so-called marginal probability where we have integrated or summed away one of the degrees of freedom. And then when we combine these, we have uh, something which is also called the conditional probability. 
And the conditional probability is actually this quantity here, P of A given B. And if I use now the product rule, we can write this as the probability of A and B divided by P of B. If now P of B is obviously larger than zero. And this is something which I can actually rewrite in terms of if I now combine these with the uh, marginal probability, the marginal probability and the product rule, I can actually combine this to what is Bayes' theorem. So you can interchange this and you can have P of B given A. So what we would have then is that this P of A given a B can now be written out when I use a product rule as P of B given A multiplied with P of A and divided by this marginal probability. And this is a P of B of A given by middle A multiplied with P of A equal to little a. And this is essentially Bayes theorem. So the denominator which you see acts as a normalization factor. So that's the one which normalizes your probability distribution. So these things have names in the literature. So this is called a posterior probability. This quantity which you see here is just called a likelihood. And this quantity here is called a prior. And the quantity which you see in the denominator here is just a normalization factor. So these are names which you will encounter when you look at Bayesian statistics. So I know that many of you have actually seen Bayes' theorem. Now, what we are going to do now is actually to link that with rich and lasso regression. And you will see that we can actually give a nice interpretation to the parameters, this regularization or hyperparameters, which we have in lasso and rich regression. So the thing is that what we did now was to find a probability for Y given beta. But now we could ask the question, what is the probability for beta with given the domain of the uh, inputs and outputs which we have. So we have a model, and the thing with Bayes' theorem is a beautiful theorem. It's so simple, but it requires that you have a model for these probabilities. It requires you having a model for the likelihood, which means that you bake in all your knowledge about a specific system in the likelihood. And then you need a model for the prior, so how this B is distributed. And there is a simple distribution if you don't have any idea, which actually many people just set the prior to, I mean, this P of B. So what's the simplest, simplest distribution you can think of? Yeah? The uniform, exactly. So the uniform distribution is the simplest one we can think of. And that means that every event has the same probability. So if you do that, that means that this P of B is just going to be a constant for you. And then with just a constant, if, you, if your likelihood is a Gaussian, then your posterior will also be a Gaussian multiplied by a constant. So that's always a useful test when you're doing Bayesian statistics and you do it numerically. If you just plug in a uniform distribution, which it just brings in a constant, and you multiply that with your likelihood, then your final distribution should just be the likelihood times a constant. Okay, so what we have, if we now go back, is that our P of B given A, in our case, is going to be P of D given beta. That's the one we want to introduce now. And we have a model for this. So we have made the assumption that the Ys follow a Gaussian distribution. That's the model which we have been cooking up. So everything now which we deal with when we want to make this statistical link are assumptions about the data. 
we may not know the probability distribution. So our data may follow something totally different. And then clearly this kind of approach would fail in describing the data. But you could get something which fits the data perfectly, but it may just be a crappy model. Then what we want to is that this P, which we put up here, A given B, so P of A given B, we are going to find the probability of beta given a D. So we are asking the question now, what is the probability of finding this parameter beta, which represents the data? So let's now use Bayes' theorem. So what that means, if we use the theorem, then we would have a beta given D, and I'm taking away the normalization constant because that's just a constant, right? So the denominator is a normalization constant. So that means that what I'm going to get now is a P, this is known, and then beta. But then I need to make an assumption about beta. So I need actually a model. So how to model beta? So let me see if I can trigger your intuition a little bit here. When we did ordinary least squares, what kind of probability would beta follow then? It was already mentioned, yeah? Uniform, again, because when we do ordinary least squares, then we don't have a probability for beta, which is just given by constant, right? So in ordinary least squares, so just to bring that up, in ordinary least squares, we just put this to a constant. We actually don't have it in the equations. So when we took the derivative, we got the standard mean squared error, right? So that means that if I stay with ordinary least squares, what that means is that the betas are also distributed according to a normal distribution. So that's the first point. But now we can become a little bit more cocky and be self-confident and we can introduce another contribution. Another, so not contribution, distribution. So if we now write it down here, so in ordinary least squares, OLS, then this P of beta is given by the uniform distribution. It's given by a constant, which we actually put to one and we could simply say that this is, is given by uniform distribution. Now, what we could do next, and I'm not going to put rigid lasso, but I'm going to make an assumption here now that this P of beta is now given, and I'm assuming that the betas are independent and identically distributed, and I'm just gonna give them a normal distribution with zero mean, so it's gonna be the product of all the beta values. So we have P minus one, and then E to the minus beta J squared, and then we have a standard devi deviation and variance. So that means that the betas are now assumed to follow a normal distribution with zero mean and a variance, which is this quantity tau squared. Okay? So I'm just making, keep in mind now that one of the uh, criticisms against Bayesian statistics has always been that Bayesian statistics is based on your belief in a prior and a likelihood. Because that's going obviously to condition your result. However, if I do this now, what we can find is the following. So I will find now that P of beta of D, so the probability of beta given D is now, and I'm taking away the constant from the denominator. That's just a normalization constant. And that is a normalization constant for a Gaussian distribution or a normal distribution, which it just contains pi squared, the square root of pi to something. And this is now given by the product of, I'm going to put this equal to i, 
So I have the distribution for y's. So this is 1 divided by 2 pi squared sigma squared. And then I have the exponential. And then I have minus y of i minus x of i multiplied with beta squared divided by 2. And then I have the sigma squared. And this is multiplied with uh, the probability beta, which now runs up all to all the features over all the features which we have in the model. And this is given by an e to the minus beta j squared divided by 2 tau squared. So what I'm going to do next is to maximize or minimize this function. So I want to find the maximal likelihood. That means I can take the log again, and I can decide whether I want to have a negative or positive log, so I can maximize or minimize. So if I do that, I can take the log now, and then I would define a cost function, C of beta, which is given by minus log of P of beta with a given D. And if we now do the calculations here, what we get is n divided by 2, and then I have log of 2 pi, and then I have a sigma squared, and then I have a plus, and now we, we get the standard term which we had from ordinary least squares, which is the norm 2 of uh, y minus x times beta. So this is a norm 2 squared divided by this 2 sigma squared, but then I get plus 1 over 2 pi squared times beta squared. And then what I'm going to do now is that I let my 1 over 2 tau squared go over to lambda. And then, and I take away all the constants, then I get C beta, which is given by this norm of y minus x times beta divided by 2 sigma squared plus lambda multiplied with norm of beta squared, the norm 2 of beta squared. And this is nothing but rich regression. So this is rich. So if you then look at the, a plot here, we can then start to understand a little bit the role of the parameter lambda. And note also that lambda is always larger than zero, because now we are going to interpret lambda as the inverse variance or standard deviation. So lambda is actually a parameter now, which can never be negative, because the variance is not negative. So lambda is always larger than zero. So if you now make a plot here as a function of a given value beta j, and then we look at the probability for this specific beta j, and we center this around zero, so this is a mu of beta j equal to zero, this has a uh, stand, one standard deviation is now given by this uh, parameter tau, and the variance is given by tau squared. So that means that if I shrink, so shrinking this parameter tau, or increasing lambda, or decreasing tau, which means shrinking or de no wait, shrinking, increasing, sorry. The logic is shrinking, shrinking or increasing tau or decreasing lambda, that affects the variance 
and thereby standard deviation. Deviation of the parameters or the estimators beta. Now I'm coming back to that and how we can read this when we run a specific calculation with ridge regression. So what you can think of this lambda parameter is a way to tune the spread of the parameter beta. So the, if you now think in terms of statistics, we can derive ridge regression assuming that the betas follow a normal distribution. That's pretty nice. So that gives us another way to interpret things instead of a standard linear algebra optimization problem. And this is often the kind of ways which we use when we now start looking at the results and we are making a fit. So I'm coming back to that because that's relevant to project number one. And some of you have already been plotting the parameters beta j as a function of polynomial complexity with and without noise. So how many of you have done that in, in, in project one? Okay, that's, a, that's something which tells us a lot about how these methods function and how we can actually tune the parameters beta and their variations. And that's actually important when we want to make something like a prediction with a given set of parameters beta. Now, it should be pretty obvious now from these steps uh, what lasso regression could mean. So lasso regression means that we are going to look at another distribution for the parameters beta. So let's take a closer look at that. And there is a fa there's another famous distribution, which some of you may have seen, and that's called the Laplace distribution. So this distribution here has a shape, mathematical shape, which uh, looks like a P of, and now I'm looking at an individual beta J, and this goes like E to the minus, and then I have the absolute value of beta J, and then it's divided by a parameter tau, which is gonna play much the same role as a variance. You will actually see that the variance of uh, this distribution is proportional with this parameter tau. So what we assume here is that the mean value, again, mu of each beta j is equal to zero. Actually, this parameter tau is, if you calculate the variance, uh, this is gonna be the variance of uh, this distribution as well for these parameters beta j. So that means that I can now make a new posterior calculation for beta given D, which is going to be proportional to, and I have the same distribution as before for the Ys given a, a beta. So I'm going to have one over two pi sigma squared, and then I have an exponential, same quantity, minus Y of I minus X of I of beta squared divided by two sigma squared. And then this is multiplied with a j equals zero to p minus one. And now I have a e to the minus beta j divided by tau. And if I take the negative log of this product of, the, of probabilities, then I'm actually going to get something which looks like the lasso cost function, which we set up earlier. So if I take the negative log of this quantity, minus log of P of beta, and here now I'm dropping constants. So I'm gonna put an equality sign, but I'm gonna drop the constants of one over square root of two pi sigma squared, because they are no interest when we are going to derive uh, the cost function because they just disappear, 
because we're not taking the derivatives with respect to them. So this is gonna give us C of beta, and that's going to be equal to the standard one, which we have been using many times now, X beta divided by two sigma squared, and then I'm gonna have plus one over tau multiplied with the norm one of beta. And this is the same as lasso. And lasso has a is a shorthand for, and I've actually, I realize that I've never given you the shorthand. And I have to look it up every time because I tend to forget it. So let me just bring it up again. I wrote it down here. I always have to look it up here. So lasso stands for least absolute shrinkage and selection operation. I always have to look it up. I, some of these acronyms are not. <laughs> yeah. So what you're doing now is that this one over tau, or lambda as we called it, lambda is going to be equal one over tau. So that means that if I now shrink the parameter tau, which is the same as increasing uh, lambda, or I can now increase the parameter tau. So if I increase, Clearly, if I increase, if you go back to the distributions here, actually this distribution looks more like this. So I have a beta j equal to zero. So that's the mean value, the longer the beta j axis. And the distribution is going to be peaked like this due to the absolute value. And your variance is going to be proportional with this uh, parameter tau. So that means that if you shrink tau, that means that you define more and more precisely the parameter beta. If you increase it, you may you blur it out. So that means that when you now are going back to ordinary least squares, that is the same as letting this parameter lambda go to zero, which is the same as making the variance or this kind of additional uh, contribution to the variance larger and larger and larger. So your distribution of the betas becomes more spread out. So it's a way when you now put these parameters lambda is to actually to screen away or to increase the role of a specific component beta. Now let's take a look at what we may see when we are running calculations now. So let's look at an example. So, and this is something which is relevant for project number one with different types of uh, models. And in our case, the different models are the same as polynomials of different degrees. So let's look at project one and what you might expect to see. So you could now make a fit of the parameters beta so suppose we now have an axis here where we have beta parameters. So we could have a beta zero, a beta one, a beta two, a beta three, etc. So suppose now that we fit a polynomial to degree two. That's the first fit we make. And let's make that in terms of uh, red colors. So we may have a value here, and then we could have a value here, and they have their spreads. So I'm just marking the standard deviation like that. So this is something in ordinarily squares and rich, which you can calculate analytically. And then the beta one is going to have a spread. And then you may find a beta two, which looks like this with its own spread. So this is very schematic, what I'm putting up here. 
Then we are, so this is a model with a, a polynomial of degree two. Then we rerun with a new model, which now has a degree three. So what could happen then is that we see a smaller spread here. So values like that, perhaps, but they are centered roughly around the same value. And then we could get something which uh, looks like this one, has a not smaller spread, and then we can get a smaller value here. So how these goes is something which we cannot tell a priori. And then these are the parameters with their spreads, which gives you the fit to the function, yeah? Yeah, exactly, exactly, that's correct. So the, uh, uh, what you would see now when you move on like this is that what you want, what you hope for, is that these parameters, when you increase the size of the model, they don't change too much. So that means that your beta two, when I go to a more complex model, stays more or less within the same values. If I add noise, on the other hand, what you're going to see then is that you're going to have many outliers. So if your function which, or your data you want to fit is pretty smooth, you will see that when you normally increase the complexity of the model, is that the parameters which you had from the previous model, they don't change much. So that's a typical sign that uh, increasing the complexity of the model uh, gives you roughly something which is not so different from a previous model. However, if you have many outliers, if you have lots of noise in the data, what you will see then is that these parameters will fluctuate wildly. Then when you add Nassen Ridge, you have a way to control the variance of these parameters. So you can tune down some of them or you can increase some of them. So how that kicks in is something you have to explore by really by practicing. It's not something you can tell a priori what it will look like. So this is in case of uh, smooth data. So I'm just putting up here where you have a smooth data case. So your Y is a typically smooth function. But what you can experience, so this could be another case, is something like this. So we can take a model with lots of noise. So let's put a beta zero a beta one, again a beta two, and a beta three. And we take a model of degree two, so that could have a value here, and something here, and then it could have a value here. So these are all exaggerated cases actually, and like that. Then, if I now repeat it, I could even find a value here, and that could have a larger standard deviation. I could find a value here, then don't need to match. I, this could even be negative. No, sorry, not that one. And I could find large variations here. What does this actually mean? If you, if you see such large variations between the coefficients, what does that tell you when it comes to the fitting of the data? Yeah? It could be overfitting. Uh, you could actually enter the case of overfitting, that's correct. But what, so it could be a clear sign that your more complex model is now trying to reproduce all the data. So every time you increase the complexity of the model, you're forcing the model to really reproduce as much as possible. So you enter into this regional overfitting. And what you will see then is that the parameters will really vary from model to model. Because every, at every model, you're trying to do your best, the best possible fit. So a second order polynomial may not be a good fit, but it still tries to go through all your data point. Then when you increase the complexity, you're actually making a model which really tries to go through more and more points. And then your parameters will vary considerably from case to case.
So that's a, something which is very important to look at when you analyze your parameters. Yeah. It could be. It could be. So you don't know that a priori before you actually calculated it. So before we, oh, I see time is running out. So after the break, uh, I'm going to run some uh, examples, which you'll also find in the Jupyter notebook. And after that, we are going to jump into uh, resampling methods and why we need resampling methods. Resampling techniques are actually a central part of uh, any kind of statistical analysis and machine learning methods. Okay, let's take a small break then. And I'm going to put the recording on pause for those of you online. What I wanted to do now, before we start with resampling methods, is to take a look at some examples. So the first example is a little bit a kind of repeat of Lassen Ridge and how they are shrinking the parameters. So remember that Lasso has a kind of continuous shrinking of the parameters. Whereas Lasso regression, on the other hand, drives some of the parameters to zero. Now, if you uh, run this code, which you will find in the Jupyter Notebooks, this is a pretty simple one. And you've seen this data set, which is just an exponential with x squared and uh, another exponential with x squared again, plus some random noise. In this particular case, I'm building up my uh, design matrix. So this is pretty close to what you're seeing in project number number one as well. Now, so this kind of vanilla data is something I can play around with. And what I'm doing now, I'm calculating with an error uh, or a noise, which is pretty large. So that means that my mean squared error is not going to be the best one because I have lots of noise here. But you can see then what happens when you run the calculation with region lasso. And you can see now that I've chosen parameters for region lasso uh, after I've done the uh, splitting in the train and test. Uh, I've chosen parameters, four values for this lambda, which go from 10 to the minus 3 to 10 to the 1, and then some values in between. And then I compute everything with region lasso here, and I'm using the functionality which is included in scikit-learn. But then I include the intercept. And then I compute the mean squared error, I make a plot of it, and this is on the test data. And what you will see now is that when this lambda is 10 to the minus 3, which is this one, the first row here are the, the parameters. So this is beta 0, beta 1, beta 2, beta 3, and beta 4. I made a four-folder poly, four polynomial. So, uh, and the second row here is the... Um, the lasso results, and you see that lasso is already driving some of the parameters to zero. Whereas uh, what happens with the ridge regression is that you have a, a slow, slow shrinking of the parameters. So when this lambda is uh, 2 times 10 to the minus 2 here, you see that the parameters are changing, they're getting smaller, but not that small. Whereas with the lasso, I'm already driving to zero almost all of the parameters. And then when I've gone to 10 to the first, I mean the parameters for lasso are all zero. And you see then that the mean squared error just blows up. And the only contribution to the mean squared error is actually your data points. So if I'd continued, it would just have reached a plateau, which would be just the data points you have. Now, this is a typical example. And when you're fitting a function, you don't know whether ordinary least square does best or not. In this specific case, it's actually ordinary least squares, which has the smallest standard deviation. And lambda and no, ridge and lasso, they get closer and closer when you drive this parameter lambda to zero. When you increase lambda, especially for lasso here, where you drive all the parameters to zero, then you see that the mean squared error just blow, blows up. So these kind of patterns are things which you will see when you deal with project number one. And it may happen that ordinary least squares is what gives the best results. But when you then apply the methods to data which are not given by these simple, nice functions, then you may actually see that the other methods in general do a better job. That means for us, a better job means a smaller mean squared error. And all the kind of 
scores which you put on your data uh, will normally behave better with these methods. But you would have to tune the parameters lambda and find the best values for, let's say, the mean squared error. So I'm just plotting the mean squared error, but many people would also plot the R2 score and many other types of score, depending on the data set which you have. And when we are coming to classification problems, you are going to encounter other types of uh, scores. Okay, now let's go back to what we discussed a little bit before the break. And let's rerun this code, but now let's only focus on uh, ridge regression. So what I'm doing now, I'm taking away the noise and I'm doing a fit of a polynomial of degree five. And uh, I'm running that with only one parameter lambda because else we're gonna get too much output here. So I'm just setting up lambda, as you can see, 10 to the minus three. Then I fit, make the fit and I print the, the parameters from the fit, the parameters beta. So if I run this, you will now see that since this is a fourth order polynomial here, which I have, I'm getting the intercept, the linear term, second order, third order, and then there's a term here, which is zero. Now take a look at these numbers. What I'm gonna do next now is to increase the complexity of the model. So I, I should write them down here. So we have a, a, a beta zero, we have a beta zero, 1.0 something, beta one, which is given by 0 0.12185, beta two, which in this case is minus, and this is, we don't need more than the order magnitude here. So that was given by 0 0.7 something. So what I'm gonna do now is to rerun this with a, a high order polynomial. So let's do that. And what you will see now is that these parameters don't change that much. There's not a dramatic change. There are changes because you, you're obviously introducing a new polynomial. But if you look at the parameter beta two is minus 0.83, it was previously minus 0.1. So it's not changing by an order of magnitude. It's not even changing sign. So there are changes because they, you redistribute strength and it means that some of the parameters may actually change. But the, the first parameters, there is not the first ones, beta one, beta zero and beta two. There is not a dramatic change there. Yeah? Why is the highest order beta Uh, because I think, uh, uh, let me see, because it should be a seventh order polynomial here, right? Yeah, I actually haven't thought of that. Yeah, that should actually, it should have given a fit here. Let me check that, why it doesn't give me that. Are you going to check? Maybe I have to add one to the polynomial degree or something. Yeah, I think it was in the, yeah, it may be, it may have been here, right? Max in, in this sum, right? Let's rerun. Yeah, thanks. That was a missing plus one. Thanks. The many eagle eyes here. Goody. What should I have done without you guys? Thanks. So the, uh, the, uh, the thing you see now is that there's not a dramatic change. Let's now add noise to the, uh, the fit here. So if we now go back and include the noise, and let's keep a pretty large noise and go back to polynomial degree five. So if you do a degree of five, you have a, let's, let's just look at this parameter here, beta two, which is 1.21. And then we just rerun it 
with a higher degree polynomial. And now you see the sudden see that there's a pretty large change in the parameters. So it drops from 1.2 to minus 3.4. So that's a pretty large change. And this is a typical sign that when you have lots of noise and outliers, it's uh, when you increase a, the polynomial order, it's trying to uh, traverse uh, the points better and better. That can easily lead to overfitting when you then are trying to implement the model on the test data as well. So a clear sign that your model is struggling to fit the data is something like this, that the coefficients will vary from order to order quite a lot. They will vary, but the changes may be pretty large. So these are typical things which you will observe when you are uh, looking at your beta parameters in project number one. Any questions? So when you're then doing ridge regression and you increase the size of lambda, then many of these parameters will actually be driven closer and closer to zero. And that means that you will only have some of the leading few ones, the largest ones often, which will stay. This is also something which you will notice when you tune ridge and lasso regression as a function of the parameters lambda. <clears throat> Any questions concerning these topics? So this is something, which, this is just a small aside in project number one, but it's something which gives you a little bit more insight about the models you're studying. Because now we are getting into this discussion of overfitting, uh, what does it mean? Uh, how can we uh, uh, improve the quality of the model? How can we actually tell somebody who wants to use our model that we did the best possible job in fitting the data? So this leads us to uh, this kind of collection of statistical topics, which are called resampling techniques. But we need also to look at this bias variance trade-off, because that's a kind of measure which people often uh, repeat and use again and again in order to gauge the quality of your model. And we are going to uh, look at uh, the mean squared error, because from a pedagogical point of view, that is normally the quantity which is easier to understand in terms of this bias variance trade-off. If you go to more complex uh, cost functions, it may not be that transparent. So I will stay with the uh, mean squared error when we're making this bias variance analysis. And that's the standard analysis you will encounter in basically all textbooks. So I'm going to uh, uh, first just bring up some uh, motivation here. So the, uh, uh, the, there are several reasons for why we look at these kind of resampling techniques. So uh, we want to uh, make a precise estimate of uh, mean values. We want to make a precise estimate of the mean squared error. So if somebody gives you a mean squared error, remember that this is always a sample mean. That means it may not be the true mean squared error. So what you have to do with resampling techniques is actually to provide an improved mean squared error. Now, for the kind of vanilla data which you have here in project number one, the first ones, you could actually generate new data sets continuously. And you could generate as much data as you, as you want. And that's a typical case where you can get a better and better mean squared error because the more data you have, hopefully the mean squared error becomes better. So you have this uh, big number theorem or the theorem of large numbers, which simply says that when you go in, uh, into samples with larger and larger values of n, you're actually approaching the true mean value or the true expectation value of a given quantity. So ideally, we would like to have as much data as possible. Now, if you then uh, look at the data which you have, this is often not possible. So it's uh, very unlikely that you will be able to run a new population survey. So if you have a, in medical research, you may have population surveys which go over thousands of patients over decades. So the data you will then have are the data you have. There's no way you can actually make a new survey 
unless you get finance to do that. But that will take another 30 years, for instance. Or if you run a complicated experiment, a dangerous one, it's not likely that you will be allowed to rerun that experiment. So that means that the data you have in most cases, except the simple cases which we've been looking at project one and the ones which I love to run here, they uh, will normally be data sets which simply are the data you have. And that means uh, that resampling methods are methods which are actually used to provide a better estimate of, for instance, the mean squared error or the mean values or the variance of a specific quantity. So the simplest method, which is very much used, is called the bootstrap. And that's the one I'm going to start looking at first. Uh, the bootstrap uh, was introduced by Efron back in the 70s. And you will see that it has uh, tens of thousands of citations because it's so simple. So the bootstrap goes as follows. And it's, it's something you can explain simply in words. So if you have supposed 10,000 data points, then this is your data. What you can do then is to produce a new data set with these 10,000 data points. By reshuffling the data randomly and placing them back with the replace of so reshuffling with the replacement. So that means of this 10,000 data, the next time you reshuffle them, you could pick the same entry more than one time. So suppose you have this 10,000 data, you could actually pick entry number three, let's say 10 times. Now, this is your new data set. So data set two. Then you reshuffle again with replacement. And that's data set three. And then you repeat, repeat as many times as you want. And normally you do that less than the number of data you have. So that means if you do this thousand times, you have thousand data sets. So what Efron, when Efron introduced this method, then it was introduced in a very ad hoc way. And after that, it has actually generated a lot of discussions and literature in mathematics and statistics. And you can actually show that if your events are identically distributed and independent, you're going to approach the true expectation values. So that's a proof which I'm just stating. I'm not going to go through that in, in the lectures here. So the bootstrap method is one of these ways, if the data are independent and identically distributed, is a resampling way, which allows you to generate new data sets with the same data set. This sounds like black magic, right? And then still obtain a pretty precise mean value or a mean squared error. So when you present a mean squared error, when you see them in textbooks, it's not a run over the 10,000 data points once, but it's actually a run over the same data points many times with some kind of resampling technique. So the overarching philosophy here is that you want to provide the users of your model with reliable estimates of your expectation values, whether that's the mean value or whether it's the mean squared error, the mean squared error is also an expectation value and so on. So the quantities you want to present, you want to be sure that, let's say the uh, mean squared error for the test is something you can say, I can provide you this with a certain confidence. So the bootstrap is a very simple method, but it's a little bit delicate because it's, it requires that you assume that your data are independent and identically distributed. And you may not know whether that's the case. A method which is then much more used is actually cross-validation. And that's a, a method which is also very simple to implement. And we are going to spend the rest of the time today and tomorrow in discussing these methods. And we're also going to link them up with the bias variance trade-off. So there's another thing which uh, I wanted to say a little bit about. And uh, uh, so these resampling techniques, uh, if we think of them, uh, many of the simulations are actually, you can treat them as computer experiment. And if we're running Monte Carlo calculations, this is actually the case. And you will typically analyze your data with the same statistical tools, which you use when you also analyze experimental data, like data from a given collection of, of 
from experiment. And we are always looking for expectation values and an estimate of how accurate they are, possible sources for errors and so on. And the type of errors which uh, we normally encounter are statistical errors and systematical errors. And statistical errors are those which we can deal with here. Those are the errors which we can analyze with the tools of statistics. Systematic errors are much worse because they may have some inherent, be related to some inherent property of a model. And they are much more difficult to estimate. So the kind of errors we are looking at will essentially be statistical errors. That's the main focus here. So, uh, the, uh, in a discussion which you will see here, so one of the prediction errors or just a test error is where we have a fixed training set and a test error and the, we are using the mean squared error from the data. But we're also going to discuss the training error. But the test error is one of the quantities which we typically end up with providing a potential user of our model. Uh, in the project, you are trying to reproduce this figure 2-1 in the book of Hasty et al. And that's an example where you plot the test error and where you plot the training error. But the way you have done it till now is simply to run through the data once. But now we're actually going to provide an estimate of the test error and the train error by using resampling techniques. And then hopefully for every data set we have, we're actually doing a slightly better job. Then uh, one of the holy grails, which we are going to discuss a little bit, is this bias variance trade-off. And I just wanted to give you a kind of bird's view on it. There's a figure here, which hopefully says much of this stuff here. So let me just bring up that figure before we look at uh, the mathematics here. So the, uh, let me just bring this up on the slides first. And let me say a little bit so that you have the kind of overarching motivation first. So I'm going to call this uh, resampling techniques and bias variance trade-off and more. So bias, sorry. So I just wanted to give you some kind of overarching arguments first, plus resampling techniques. So we are going to cover uh, several of these resampling techniques. So we are going to look at bootstrap. We are going to look at the cross validation, which is another one, which is widely used. We could also think of another method, which is called a jackknife. So the um, bootstrap was actually a method which was inspired by the jackknife method. So I'm going to mention that in the bypassing. If we then look at these resampling techniques, uh, one of the things which we are interested in then is actually to be able to estimate in a better way the uh, mean squared error and other expectation values. whether this is the mean value or the variance and so on. And remember again that basically for all the data sets which we have, we don't know the true distribution. If we knew the distribution, we would then most likely be able to calculate the true expectation values. But we will always be confined to evaluate the sampled expectation value. So that means that we will have a one over n and the sum over the data sets, if you're calculating the mean value, just the entries. If you're calculating the mean squared error, it's actually this quantity here. So we can actually rewrite this quantity in the following way. So I'm just gonna set it up here for you. And 
if we just remind ourselves about that, so it's going to be a y of i minus a y of i tilde squared. So this is the mean squared error, and we want to have an estimate for that one. Now, this mean squared error is something which we can rewrite in terms of something I'm going to call a bias, and tomorrow we are going to look at the derivation of that, plus the variance of the model y tilde, so that's the variance of the model, plus the variance which we have from the noise, where we have made the assumption that our y is given by some function f of x, and this f of x is approximated by this y tilde, plus some normal distributed noise. This is the assumption we have made when we develop the model. So what we can do then is to develop, to actually rewrite this mean squared error. And this is why this bias variance trade-off is always discussed in terms of the mean squared error, because from a pedagogical point, this is the simplest way of doing it. So this uh, bias is something which measures the average value of your data points, the output, minus the mean value of the model. So it's the deviation of your mean value of the model from the data points. That's the bias. So bias means that you have a bias, a prejudice in your model with a certain mean value, and then you measure the difference between that mean value of your model and the difference between what the output should be. So I'm not going to derive the equations today, so I'm going to leave that for tomorrow, and also that's one of the exercises in the project, but we are going to baby step ourselves through that tomorrow, so you can see the details. But I wanted to give you the kind of uh, bird's view on what goes on here. And there is an image in the slides which actually may help in developing your kind of your intuition about it. So if you think of the, the red, the inner circle here, that's your data. That's what you want to reproduce, right? So the red circle here. So it could be a game of dart. I mean, my game of dart, when I play darts, looks like the one down here. Yeah, to the right. I'm basically hopeless there. But the, the, uh, if you look at the uh, uh, lower to the left, which says high bias and low variance. So high bias means that you're away from the data. So if you take and measure the difference between the mean value of your model and the data you want to reproduce, you have a large difference. So that means that you're, you have a high bias, but you have a low variance. So low variance in your model means that the entries in your model minus the mean value of the model is very small. So that means you're doing a pretty good job with your model. So your model doesn't have large fluctuations. And that's what you see if you look at the figure here. So you have a low variance in your model, but you have a high bias. The ideal is obviously this one. You can have a low bias in your model, so you're pretty close to the exact value. However, your model has a broad spread. So high variance is something which we normally link with overfitting. And we're coming back to why we can link this with overfitting. Then we have the, the final one. This is where I actually feel my life always has been high bias and high variance. So this is actually a clear indication that you're not doing too well. So let's go back to the, uh, so this is a kind of, uh, when you now are going to see the derivations of the equations, keep this figure in mind. So this actually co conveys uh, quite a lot of the basic messages. So the hope is that it gives you a kind of overarching view before you've started to look at uh, the equations. So let's go back a little bit to the, uh, to the whiteboard. <clears throat> 
So a typical calculation which we are going to do now. So the first thing we, we will typically run is this figure 2-1 of Hasty et al. So which you have in one of the assignments in the project. And then what you're going to see is something like this. So you have a model complexity on the x-axis. And here we can plot one of the measures or the scores. It could be the MSE or it could be the R2 score. And what you normally see then is that on your training data, so this would be your training error, MSE train. It behaves uh, like this, it goes basically to zero. The more complex we make the model. So how many of you have seen that in project number one already? That's quite a many. That's good. Then, when we then look at our test data, it will typically often follow here, and then it suddenly kicks up here. So this could be the MSE test. Now, one thing which is important, when we are making these plots, we are actually going to make these plots based on the resampling of the data. So that means that we have actually calculated the mean squared error for many data sets, where we simply have either reshuffled it or we've been using this cross-validation method. So these are the expectation values you have here when we ring them out. That is not normally one run, but it's actually a run where you have resampled over many data sets. So this point which you see here, this specific point, this is one where we will have the optimal model. And this is clearly a sign of overfitting. Then we can actually break this uh, uh, plot here down into this bias variance trade-off. And then it's gonna look a little bit different. Keep in mind that these kind of figures you're gonna make, they're gonna look different from number of data, from one set of data points to another set of data points. So in your vanilla case, in the Franke function, where you can generate, let's say, 100 data points, you will get a different behavior from when you have 1,000 data points. So how many of you have seen that in project one? No, okay, one has seen that, good. So this is something you will see when you plot it as a number of uh, data points. And often in textbooks, these are kind of idealized cases. And if you run a specific model on a set of data, it may not happen that you see this kind of going up because perhaps your model is pretty good and does well in predicting data which was not included. So when we then move over to the bias variance trade-off, So what you will often see then is the following. So we have still on the axis here, we have the model complexity. But in this case, you would make only the plot on the mean squared error for the test data. You won't do that on the training because the training just becomes better and better when you increase the complexity. So what you want to test now is your test data. So what you would plot then would be the MSE squared error. Well, let me just rewrite this a little bit better. MSE for the test data. So what we saw then is that we had a figure which went like this. So we had an optimal model here, 
Then, when you're plotting this bias, what you would see then is that there would be a contribution like this. So these curves are not to scale, where this goes like that. So that would be the bias term. And then we would have down here, we would have roughly zero. And then at a certain point here, these two curves, let me just, oops. Plot, and then this goes up here. So this would be the so-called variance of the model of Y tilde. So when we make this analysis, the kind of point where these two curves intersect here is normally roughly where we have the optimal model. And you will see a typically increasing variance. And this will be the case when you're overfitting. And tomorrow we are going to discuss these things in a little bit more detail. But what I wanted to bring up now are the resampling techniques themselves. And the reason for why I want to do that is that I want to bring up an important theorem in statistics and show you actually what these resampling techniques are doing in practice. So there is an important theorem in statistics which is called the central limit theorem. Has any one of you heard of that in statistics? Okay. So just to restate it, it's the central limit theorem says that if you have independent and identically distributed events, then in the limit of large numbers, the distribution for all these events is going to approach a Gaussian distribution. That's what it says. But the assumption is that the events are independent and identically distributed. If they are not, then there's no guarantee that the central limit theorem holds. So it's a very important theorem. And when you're dealing with a method like bootstrap, it simply uses the central limit theorem in order to prove that you're actually going to approach the correct expectation values without you knowing the distribution. So clearly, if things are not independent and identically distributed, there is no guarantee that in the limit of large numbers, the numbers the, or the events will be distributed according to a normal or Gaussian distribution. So this is one of the assumptions which is also used for distributing grades. So I always refuse to distribute grades according to a normal distribution, period. That's because I, I don't think that we are here independent and identically distributed. Okay. That was a digression. Now, what I wanted to look at now is actually this uh, the bootstrap method, and we are going to uh, set it up. So this is a way to resample our data. But in order to discuss it, we need also this theorem, which is called the central limit theorem. But let's look at the bootstrap method first, because it's extremely simple. So we have a domain of data. And let's now just uh, simply assume that we have a very simple data set. So the domain D. And this domain D consists now of data points, which I call set zero set one up to some set n minus one. So these are our data. And I don't specify them in more depth than actually this. So you could think of you generating some events from a Gaussian distribution. And you do that, let's say 10,000 times. That's one typical example. So the next thing I do, so this is my data set. And what I could do now is to calculate the mean value, or I could calculate the variance, or I could calculate the mean squared error if I want to. 
So based on this data set, I could now calculate the mean value, the mean mu, which would be one over n. And this is simply a sum from i equals zero to n minus one of z of i. So clearly what I would like to do now is to be able to assess whether this mean value is reliable or not. Whether if somebody were to give me the exact distribution, whether this mu which I calculate would be close to the exact distribution. So what I would do next, my next step is to reshuffle data data randomly with replacement. So then I'm going to produce a primed data set, D prime, which is going to have a Z0 prime, a Z1 up to N minus one. And now these are primed. Now what could happen is that in this slot here, let's call this a Z of I, we could have the original Z0, let's say two times. And in another slot, we could have a Z3 10 times. So what we are doing now is that we are reshuffling the data and then we are picking new data points. And that means that we can pick. So if you have 10,000 data points, first we reshuffle them randomly, okay? And then we pick one point of this 10,000. And then we pick a new point, a new point, and we do this 10,000 times. But every time we do it, we put back the one we picked. You follow me here? So this is normally called with replacement. So I first I reshuffle randomly the whole data set. So the sequence is different. And then I pick 10,000 randomly. Yeah? If you're randomly picking, why do you have to sum for you? You, 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 yeah, you have to, you want to treat this as something which is different from the, the data points which you had before. So you reshuffle it because then if you go to point number one, it may not be the same which was there before. Say it again. Yeah, I have to rethink of that one. I, now because when, when you, so you reshuffle it randomly and then you have a new sequence of numbers, right? Yeah. So number 10 may now be number zero, right? And then you pick in this data set randomly the slots here, right? With replacement. So you may actually pick the new zero. You may pick that 10 times, for instance. I mean, what you're saying is if you're already picking at random, why yeah. don't you shuffle it randomly first? Okay, so okay. Twice, like yeah, yeah. Twice, randomly twice, randomly twice, randomly twice. Is it just because it's super random? Yeah, I, ha I have to check that whether, I, I'm gonna check that because I, I think it, I think it normally reshuffles everything randomly and then you pick the data points randomly. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to check whether it does both or just does one of them. Yeah. Okay, let me check that. That's a good point. Okay. Oops. So, but then you, with replacement, you have now a new data set, which hopefully is different from the previous one. And then you just repeat this B times. Now, for each set, you would calculate an expectation value. So suppose the mean value is the one you're calculating. So uh, assume you want to make an estimate, you want to estimate the mean value. 
So for each sample, then you have a value for this mu. And let's call this a little b here. So that means that the total mu is now going to be a sum over all the samples which we have. And this is going to run from i equal one up to b of this mu of b, of, let's call this mu of i. So let me just change a little bit here. So this is the specific sample b. So let's just stay with the b as a letter here. Sorry. So this is a b, and this mu of b of little b is actually given by one over n, and this has a sum over i equals zero to n minus one. And this is now running over the specific sample, and we just put a prime here just to indicate that that's one of the specific samples. So that means that you calculate this mean value for every sample you have produced, and then you keep repeating. Now, if you have a Gaussian distribution, so suppose now, and let's look at an example here. Let's see at a little bit over time here. Suppose these mu's for this variable z follow a normal distribution with a certain mean value and a certain variance. So what I'm going to show tomorrow, because I see my time is running out here, I'm going to show you first that if I assume that this z's follow a normal distribution, when I now resample it again and again, I'm going to show you numerically that you get back a normal distribution. So it means that, that we are going to get a new distribution. So we get a new distribution. Which is also going to be a normal distribution and it's going to have a sigma squared divided by b but what's the mean value going to be it's going to be hopefully new it's going to stay the same because the mean value uh, if that's 100 if you repeat this again and again and again, it should still give you 100. So the mean value should stay the same. And this is actually the, what the central limit theorem promises. So tomorrow I'm gonna to first to show this numerically by just running an example. And then I'm going to prove it by showing you the central limit theorem. And that means that uh, uh, what you're going to get then is actually an expectation value, which hopefully is as close as possible to the true value. And when you run calculations, you will typically perform this kind of resamplings again and again, mainly because you will have a limited data set at your disposal. So tomorrow, uh, more on resampling and the central limit theorem. And then we're going to look at the bias variance trade-off in more detail. Okay, thank you.